having too much of that thing you loved or of it getting out of balance. For example, if you love the idea of, a God call, of God calling a prophet today who would provide direction and guidance in a troubled world, are you also bothered by the constraints of too many rules to follow? Or do you get annoyed that people don't seem to think for themselves? From another angle, do you get overly frustrated with people who don't seem to be following the prophet or annoyed that the prophet won't be clearer about what is expected on some things? These are the flip sides of the coin that come with the blessing of having a living prophet. We really can't get the side of the coin we like without getting the other side of the coin that we don't like so well. As we look at the things that irritate us in others, including spouses, God, and church leaders, sometimes we find that we also tend to get angry with people for things we don't give ourselves permission to do, even though we sometimes need to do that thing. For example, I may get annoyed with my friendly, outgoing husband because I really don't give my per myself permission to be friendly, but I insist instead on seeing myself as too shy to act that way. I may get irritated with church leaders who are dogmatic or rule-bound precisely because I don't really stick to my guns on things that matter to me, don't give myself permission to insist on some things even when it's difficult or when I confront opposition, or to admit that sometimes I have to take a stand and act even when there are other legitimate points of view. Um, I had a, a fun example of this one. Um, with my daughter lately who's into colors. Everybody's got a color, you know, you're a red and you're a yellow and you're a blue and I don't know. And we were talking about the fact that we didn't, neither one of us did very well with yellow people. Um, and, uh, and then I started thinking about this issue, why do yellow people irritate me? Well, yellow people, just in case you're not into this, are people who are motivated by having fun. And I thought, why do yellow people annoy me? That seems like that should be a good thing. And then I started thinking, I don't do so well at having fun. I don't really give myself a lot of permission to have fun. I see fun as being sort of a frivolous thing that we don't have time for if we're going to be serious and important. And so I don't, I don't let myself do that. I don't let myself be very yellow. So yellow people annoy me. But really what it boils down to is I need more yellow in my life. So are there ways that you, give, that you get angry with the church for behavior or attitudes you actually need more of in your life, but don't allow yourself? Do you get upset with other people's blind obedience when in fact trust in things you don't fully understand is something you just don't allow yourself because it seems too dangerous? But your lack of trust is actually creating problems and keeping you out of balance, or whatever it might be. Recognizing blind spots, of course, does not cure them, but it does allow for the possibility of tackling these issues from a different angle. As long as we assume that we are being reasonable and conscientious when we tackle a doubt or a question, then our solution will be to examine the science and the logic and the reasonableness of the available answers. But when we assume that at least some of the questions that trouble us may be affected by our blind spots, as well as by history or logic, we get new options. We probably won't like the options very much, but we at least have new options. The good news is that as we see the places of where our perception of the church are unduly impacted by our own history, by our prior betrayals or unmet needs, we can begin to work on what we can control rather than waiting for God or the church to change things we don't control. So once I begin to imagine that I may have some spiritual blind spots and what some of them might be, how can I begin to access the healing that Christ came to earth to provide? Let me suggest some possibilities. First, we can remember that blindness is not a cause for shame. In fact, we are all blind in one degree or another, in one way or another. Uncovering our blindness is a major goal of mortality. Feeling ashamed of our blindness tends to lead us to hiding it and defending it, not correcting it. Instead, we can work to accept our blindness as part of mortality to learn about and compensate for, rather than to hide and defend. When we feel less shame about being blind, we are also freer to concentrate on the beam in our own eyes and not the moat in others. Second, we can ask for help in seeing our blindness 
Self-awareness takes effort and skill, but it gives us options we don't have when we are ignorant of our blindness. Self-awareness is facilitated by specific prayer for help in seeing our blindness and then actively and humbly searching it out rather than ignoring, hiding, or defending it. Friends, spouses, parents, children, therapists, and bishops are often very astute at teaching us about our blindness if we will ask them to do so. If we can listen non-defensively to the Spirit and other people, we can begin to see differently. And third, we can patiently look for bigger stories than the ones we live in. Sometimes our stories are just not big enough to hold both the problems or questions that plague us and the best answers to them. We lose our peripheral vision. We can no longer see a clear path between where we are and where we're trying to go. So let me give you an example. I share with permission the story of a young man of unusual intellectual capacity facing some serious doubts and questions about the church and his experience in it. He's hesitant to offer a proffered scholarship to a church school given his struggles, and he spends several months removed from church activity, determined to get over the church, even though he assumes there will be a period of deeply missing it after having lived within it all his life. He does miss it, but he can see no reasonable alternative to distancing from it when no, it no longer fits with his experience and worldview. But a caring friend shares some articles with him that suggest he is not alone in his struggles and that even those who don't face his specific issue know what it means to doubt and to question. This is a very different view of what it means to be a faithful Latter-day Saint than the one he has grown up with. After reading the articles, the young man writes, I truly thought that hardly any other Mormons had ever doubted. We always teach that all mankind sins, but I thought that to doubt was to simply be infernal and devilish. I'm not kidding, I still have this remnant feeling, for Mormon culture never discusses philosophical doubts and how to approach them. He's 18. <laughs> As I read these words, however, I realized that there is much hope for my spiritual journey. Why was this simple insight that other Mormons sometimes doubt so valuable to this man? I think it is because that insight made room for a bigger story than the one he had lived in. This new story had room in it for Mormons who doubt, who are not infernal and devilish, and who find ways to approach their doubts, sometimes resolve them, and sometimes live with them unresolved and still remain in the church. The articles he read gave him a new set of possibilities of how other people's stories unfold, giving him new options for how his own story might continue. As Latter-day Saints, we're sometimes inclined to see religion as what helps us avoid hardship and tragedy, the yellow brick road that will keep us from lung cancer, alcohol addiction, AIDS, that will keep us happily connected in loving families, that will keep us moving steadily toward a future of promise and hope. Early saints, however, and our history makes it clear that we are still among them, knew that hardship and tragedy are inherent to the mortal condition. They had a big enough story to hold, getting kicked out of Missouri, having their prophet killed, crossing the plains, confronting Johnson's army, being sent to colonize a desert. Or at least the ones who stayed in the church through these events had a big enough story. That story was called Building Zion in the Face of Persecution, and it served the saints very, very well. And it serves us well, too. We still need a bigger story than the one that only keeps us safe from doubt and trial, tragedy, illness, death, questions, and disagreements. We need stories big enough to hold losing a loved one, having a heart attack, failing an exam, not getting the job or the spouse we wanted. We need a story big enough to hold a bishop who is wrong, a patriarchal blessing that is not completely fulfilled, a marriage that goes sour, a doctrinal or historical question that is not answered, a predisposition to addiction or mental illness, 
or elicit sexual longings or whatever it is that seems to make our lives not fit with the cheery messages of cheery people whose prayers are always answered, whose children always succeed, and whose lives always turn out well. <laughs> the Willie and Martin Handcart companies, stranded in early snow after a late start across the plains, offer me 